This Week in Radio Tech, episode 191, is brought to you by the Omnia One Multicast, the perfect audio processor designed for IP streaming. Its census technology actually makes audio coding more efficient. The Omnia One Multicast, on the web at omniaaudio.com. And now, our feature presentation. Twerk. Is radio engineering a pay me now or pay me later equation? Or is there more to it? Preventatively, let's make radio sound great all the time. All right, calm down. He says that to everyone. This calls for immediate discussion. What's up, Dad? Yeah. All your days are belong to us. From his palatial office of important business. Or in a choice hotel in a distant land. This is Kirk Harnack. Chris Tarr and Chris Tobin join me discussing the value equation for preventive maintenance versus emergency repairs. You're dialed in to This Week in Radio Tech. Hey, welcome into This Week in Radio Tech. I'm Kirk Harnack, your host. Delighted to be here and glad that you've decided to tune in also. By the way, this is episode number 191. If you haven't heard the previous 190 episodes, you need to rewind and go check them out. <laughs> we talk about radio technology, and sometimes we do a whole show on some technical subject. We did a, a kind of a foundation series on amplitude modulation and frequency modulation, and we've done some on HD radio and metadata, which we're going to do more of that. Uh, so we've done all kinds of, of uh, uh, subject matters with, uh, with our technical discussions, and sometimes we just have a lot of fun. Well, this show is about value and economy and all those things and how an engineer relates to the value uh, that he or she provides to the radio station. Well, I've got a couple of really great guests, very valuable engineers. Just look at their price sheet, <laughs> and you'll see, first of all, the best-dressed engineer in radio from Manhattan. Oh, no. He's live in studio in Queens, New York. It's Chris Tobin. Hey, Chris, welcome in. <laughs> Hello, Kirk. Thanks. Yes, I'm here at the uh, HQ of uh, GFQ Network, so we're having a good time. Well, we will be shortly. <laughs> What what are you doing nowadays? Can you tell us that? What am I doing nowadays? Well, um, I'm out on my own doing, uh, let's see, distribution for music equipment, uh, audio. No, actually, I'm working with the folks from Musicam. I broke away to do my own thing along with them, so I'm no longer beholden to anybody but myself. So working with Musicam products for audio and video over IP, working with <clears> the <throat> folks from Lucy, uh, doing some projects with them. And also working with a company called, um, what's it called again? Pixel Power. They do television, uh, what is it the best way to put it? Television content logging and qualifications. And there's also another company, Content Probe, I'm working with out of the UK. So uh, they, do, they do some television uh, stuff as well. I'm having a good time. Sounds to me like you're going to have to hire a CPA to do your taxes. Uh, yeah, I, I, we, <laughs> thank goodness I do have a... Uh, very good family friend who's been doing the taxes for us for a long time. So, oh, good. all but, right, uh, yeah. So I'm I'm all doing that and just uh, doing some consulting with so a couple of radio stations lately. So it's been uh, it's been a good time. And for those of you who don't know, Chris Tobin has been doing radio engineering for a long time and doing it in uh, in big markets too, especially up in the one well, the Northeast and the New York market and and markets around there. So he's looking at engineering uh, from a big market perspective most of the time. Now I started out in small market as well. Small and medium okay. market. We we go to a mid market guy. See, I'm I'm the small market guy. I'm the guy that owns a radio station in freaking American Samoa. <laughs> so I'm Breaking the small out the bills. <laughs> yeah, right. <laughs> <laughs> the medium market guy is our friend from Mukwanago, Wisconsin. It's Chris Tarr. Hey, Chris, welcome in. Hello there. I am the uh, director of operations and engineering for 889 Radio Milwaukee. Also a uh, contract engineer all over the state of Wisconsin. Uh, Co-founder of the uh, uh, broadcastengineering.info site, uh, the virtual engineer. Also a staff writer for Radio Magazine. And, and in my free time, oh well, wait, I don't have any free time. <laughs> in your free time, you're fixing transmissions, aren't you? Right, there you go. Yeah. Hey, I've been following you on Facebook. You've been doing some car repair here lately. Yeah, well, you know, actually, you know, it started out where I paid for some car repair, very expensive uh, car repair. Yeah, and, tell me. It got to the point where I couldn't afford any more car repair. It was, I like to call it punitive car repair. <laughs> uh, so then I had to, uh, there, my, my daughter comes to me after all spending all this money saying she had a car issue. So I ended yeah. up buying parts and doing it myself, which is, you know, a lot of people don't know this. They think that, you know, because I do broadcast engineering that I'm just an all around handyman. And actually, I'm not a car guy. I, you know, I pay people to change the oil. I don't really mess around with them. So, uh, you know, I don't do it very often. But I did successfully 
fixed my daughter's car the other day. It did involve crawling around underneath it and uh, breaking out some wrenches and, and getting dirty. So I was pretty proud of myself. <laughs> you know, I, I used to do a lot of uh, car repair back in my 20s and 30s, and I'm just I'm kind of over it. Plus, aren't cars a lot more difficult to, to repair now? Many of the things that go wrong, you, just, you can't do yourself. Well, yeah, and, and you know, obviously they're a lot more complicated. Well, back you know when I was a kid, I had a Chevy, you know, like a, a Chevy Nova, replace a starter, and that literally took twenty minutes. It was like a yeah. bolt or two, and you know, yeah. boom, you're done. And you have plenty of room in there to do it. Well, this was a this was an evaporate uh, evap canister and a shutoff valve in the in the uh, uh, the the canister, not the canister for her system but the whatever you know the emission system so i you know it was a whole bunch of hoses and a bunch of screws and it was this big canister that you know was mounted under the car coming out of the gas tank and uh so it was it was a little bit of a challenge but you know at the end i i got it done and my daughter's car is going in for a emissions test and i'm the best father in the world once again <laughs> is it gonna pass or did it pass i i guarantee a pass okay yeah all right yeah well, good. Yeah, we we have that here. You know, now with emissions testing, they're not even sticking the the sniffer up the tailpipe anymore. At least not for most of the cars that go through. They just plug right. into well, the electronic thing. And that's how I know it's going to pass. Is I actually one of the things I bought was a um a, you know, a while back for troubleshooting cars is they they have one of those OBD two Bluetooth dongles you can plug yeah. into your car's computer system, and then with your with your Android device. You can actually read all the codes. You can run the test to see if all the emissions equipment passes. Uh, you know, be, make sure that they're all functioning correctly and all that kind of stuff. So, after I fixed it, I was able to reset the check engine light and run all the scan tests to make sure that all the emission stuff passed. How so, cool! What, what's yeah, this device just, called? It's just an OB. It's a generic OBD2 Bluetooth uh, device. Looks, it's okay. about this big, and yeah. uh, you plug it into the into the OBD2, OBD2 port. And it talks to your Android device via Bluetooth. And then you get a program, uh, Torque Pro is what I'm using. And it reads, you know, and it gives you real time data, RPM, throttle position, all that kind of stuff. But what's great is when the check engine light comes on, that's how I knew what to fix. Is when the uh, check engine light came on, I had it read the code and looked it up and figured out what it was that, that I needed to fix, replace everything, reset the code, and then ran the diagnost, you know, drove it around for a little while and then ran the diagnostics to make sure that all the parts were working. And uh, that's what the uh, DMV does, is they just plug it in, and as long as all of the systems pass, it's a pass. You can, yeah, so you can fix your own car. It's just a different technique now than it used to be. See, it used to be that to get your car to pass emissions, it, like in Memphis, Tennessee, I lived in Memphis for almost 10 years, to get your car guaranteed to pass emissions, all it required was a $20 bill, and you could pass the emissions <laughs> test. Magic. Yeah, not so much anymore. It's still that way in New York. <laughs> Is the really same way in well, there's, there's a whole lot of stuff you can get done in New York for twenty bucks. <laughs> <laughs> you know, you're talking about uh, Justin Bieber and his you know extracurricular activities. That's a twenty dollar bill right there. <laughs> <laughs> All right. Well, uh, what time do we lose control of the show? <laughs> we're we're, um, we're talking on this week in Radio Tech. I'm Kirk Harnack along with Chris Tobin and Chris Tarr. And it's a, there's a chance that Tom Ray may join us here before it's all over. Hey, um, our show's topic is one that well, we've covered a little bit here and there, but we're going to spend the show on it. Um, uh, Chris Tarr made a comment uh, uh, in a public forum on Facebook um, <clears throat> this past week, uh, something about the value of engineers. And, of course, as engineers, we often feel a sense, uh, we'd like to know our, our own value. We, we think we're valuable to the organization. And um, so we kind of we have some stories and thoughts about that, and so uh, I want to jump kind of jump right into that. Chris Tar, you you made this comment on on Facebook. What led you? What led you? To, it, it sounded like you were a little bit frustrated. What led your frustration level <laughs> to to make this comment about the value of engineers? I don't know that there's any one event more than a combination. And, and I want to make clear from the outset, and I, I didn't make that real clear in the post until later on that I'm not necessarily talking about money and how much we're paid or you know anything like that. It's valuing the entire package. And I, and I guess a good example of that is, and, and I won't name names or anything, I'll use general kind of a combination, a composite of different events. But let's say you have a, a radio station and you know the general manager decides, you know what, engineering costs me a lot of money to have a full-time engineer there. We're paying him a lot of money. He's got this huge budget. You know, uh, 
nothing ever breaks. Why, why are we spending all this money? I, I think we can do it cheaper. You know, let him go. We'll find somebody cheaper to replace him. Uh, you know, and, and we'll deal with it. You know, we'll cut the budget a little bit. I'm sure we can fix more than we replace. And, you know, and it works for a little while. You know, you get you get going for a little while and things just kind of keep rolling because you've got a good steam going. And then all of a sudden, you know, things start falling apart a little bit and then they get worse and worse and worse. And, and you know, the thing is, is over time, it, it kind of becomes acceptable. It's like, you know, I, I and, and it's certainly not of the stations I've ever worked for, but there is a station in the area that was off the air for a day. And, and this is a major market, you know, mid, mid market Milwaukee radio station was off the air for mm. a day. And, and, you know, you just, I scratch my head, I'm like, you know, it never would really happen under my watch, ever. <laughs> I mean, I just, it's unfathomable. But it's it's just become, it's become kind of, oh, okay. Um, you know, another example is, uh, and, and this one I won't name names, but is a station that I do some work for. Um, you know, every year I say, listen, you know, you need to, if you don't want to do it, pay me. I'm going to, I need to come down, we need to clean out your transfer building. It's filthy and the filters are getting clogged up and you're going to have an issue where you know the transfer is going to fail and you really need to get ahead of this well no that we don't want to spend the money on that you know uh, we'll call you if we need you and sure enough they need me because the transmitter shut down because all the filters are dirty and and you know there's no airflow in the building and nobody ever paid a visit to the site and it's overgrown with stuff and now they're paying me a whole lot more to put the fire out and yeah. you know than they would have spent in the beginning plus they've been off the air and, and it just, you know, it seems like it's becoming more and more acceptable uh, for broadcasters that, you know what, uh, you know, we'll, we'll get somebody to kind of over, you know, to, to put out the fires. But, you know, if we're off the air for a little bit, ah, no big deal. We're not going to worry about it too much. You know, it's whatever. You know, we're saving a ton of money by not having somebody at the ready to take care of these things before they happen. And, and but then, uh, you know, the other side of that coin that I, I, I tell people is now I also have a client who pays me on a retainer and it's a pretty good one. And, uh, you know, you can you can bet. In fact, I can tell you in the past year, uh, a little over a year that I've been there doing their work, they've never been off the air, ever. <laughs> and, and, you know, at least once a month, I'm up there checking filters, cleaning out transmitter buildings, if they have anything wrong. I mean, they're well taken care of. And, you know, he looks at it as money well spent. He's like, if I pay you to be a fireman, then I'm only seeing you after there's something, you know, after something's been really, really wrong. He's like, I would pay you and know that, I don't have to worry about it, that things are getting taken care of. And, you know, it just seems to me like, you know, that guy is becoming rarer and rarer in this business. And and people are kind of just settling for, well, you know, if we go off the air, you know, we'll figure something out. We'll call the guy to come in and take care of it. And, uh, you know, they, they, they look at the money savings and not the value, I guess, is the bottom line of all this. They're saving some money. But they're not getting a lot of value because you know, the radio stations don't sound as good. The people who are on the air are having to deal with broken things, and they stay broken until the next time the guy is in town to to fix stuff. So you know, morale's a little you know a little poor, and you know there's just a lot of things that just aren't right, and and they don't see the value in that. They they just see the savings in the bottom line, and and I mean I guess it's okay for guys like me because I get paid either way but I, I would like to see a little more attention paid on maintenance and, and spending money up front uh, you know another example of and again I won't name names but an AM station that uh, you know more than once I've said listen you need to clear out all the vegetation out of your transitor site you know you got, it's a directional array and they got trees and brush all over and I'd say you need to clear this out and then you know oh, it's too much money i'm not going to spend it and then every couple of months i get this why is my signal not as good as what i think it, it should be you know it's it used to be really really good and it should and I, it's because you got to clear out the vent to chase well can you look at the transmitter <laughs> it's like i guarantee you it is not the transmitter i can guarantee you that you probably don't have much of a ground system left because the roots have torn it all up yeah uh, but yeah. again it's that whole you know i don't want to spend the money now and then later on the one why things just aren't optimized the way they should be. And then, you, you know, I try to point them in the direction of, look at these people who are doing it right. You know, they're on the air, everything sounds great, their people are happy, they're fully <clears> functional, <throat> and it doesn't cost, at the end of the day, it doesn't cost a whole lot more money because you're not spending a ton of money for you to spend hours fixing a problem on emergency time rather than me doing maintenance ahead of time on my time where it saves you money. Yeah, yeah. 
Yeah, I I worry about stations that okay they like like a standalone AM or or even a, a small FM that says look we're, we we I mean why wouldn't they have you to come do the preventive maintenance that they know intellectually that they're better off having preventive maintenance done but what if it's choice between that and paying yourself you know as a station owner or or paying the morning guy or you know what what if it really is that tight and see but um, that's the thing is is they they manage to find the money when it all goes south. And in most cases, if you just – if you know that in advance and you, you work with the guy, whoever you're working with, and come up with something sensible, it, it, it can be affordable. And you have to look – you know, you have to – okay, you know, let's say you really are having issues paying the bills and you need to pay yourself and you need to pay, keep the light. Okay. That, I mean that's, that's a different story. But I can tell you that with all the stations I've ever worked for, it has never been that bad. And, and to, to be honest with you – the money they have to pay me to come in an emergency is more than what they'd be paying me to come to that one. Yeah, yeah, and and I guess my point there really was, there are some stations that are in that kind of dire straits. Um, I, th there's a station or two in my group of stations that standalone stations would not be happening. And I guess my point there is maybe you ought to look at your business model if if you really can't afford to run the radio station in a way that that uh, you're just living from emergency to emergency, you know. Maybe it's time to, to turn the transmitter off or, or sell it to somebody else or if you can or give it to somebody else or look at revamping your business model, whatever that may be. Maybe you sell it full time to preachers on the air or you know, broker time. I don't know. But obviously what you're doing now doesn't afford you enough income to be able to make the decision easily to do some preventive maintenance. Do you and, find and that maybe the case at all? Absolutely, and, and, but I mean, there are there are ways to 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 deal with that, and and I think a lot of guys in, in my position are more than willing to help. You know, first of all, you know, work on you know how much we charge in certain situations. Perhaps there's you know, hey, well, you know, we'll give you a not existent ownership stake or something, some X sweat equity, or you know, there are a lot of ways to solve this. It's just that it has to be solved, and what happens is is it just kind of it becomes a, a as long as we're on the air, there aren't any problems kind of an issue. And they don't mm. see the things that are creeping around in the, you know, in, in the background. Uh, another, you know, to rehash this example, the, the guy who, uh, who I ha has me on a retainer uh, has an Autel transmitter. And during one of my visits, I noticed there was a power supply that was bad. And mm. it, that's at a power level where one power supply doesn't affect it. But if you were to lose a second or a third, it'd be an issue. Now, if I wasn't there, just doing what I always do every month, going up and making sure everything's okay, he probably would have found out about it well after it, it was an easy, quick fix that, yeah. you know, kept him on the air. Uh, you know, because you know these guys really aren't paying that kind of attention. You know, it, it's it's kind of an out-of-sight. Engineering has always been an out-of-mind, out-of-sight situation. Uh, and it's really easy to do if money's tight to just kind of go, well, we're on the air. So, great. You know, no problem. <laughs> yeah. And uh, you know, and then it's only when thing when you're not that it becomes a problem. And and again, most of the time, you know, a lot of these failures are things that for a little bit of money could have been prevented rather than waiting until it, you know, all heck breaks loose. And I, I can tell you personally that, you know, I've dealt with a couple of stations where I've cut them a break just knowing they they didn't have the money. And I said, you know, you know, they'd call me out for an emergency or something. I'd say, listen, between you and me, this really needs to be addressed. And I understand that, you know, money's a thing, but, you know, I, I'm just going to keep this, you know, I'm going to fix this. And in another six months, this is going to be a problem again, and you're going to have to pay me again. So, you know, let's work something out. You know, you tell me what, what's up and, and we'll work something out. We'll get this taken care of the right way. And then it won't be a problem again for a while. Uh, yeah. So I, I think to, um, you know, I, I do think that, that good engineers are expensive and they should be. I mean, we're very specialized and we do good work. However, you know, I do have kind of my, you know, just like lawyer has, you know, cases that they take on just because, you know, they have the skill and, and it's to help out others. I think a lot too with, you know, I've done a couple of PFMs and some, some non-comp stations at a great, really, uh, greatly reduced rate because they couldn't otherwise afford that kind of, uh, that kind of help. And, you know, I've been happy to do it. <laughs> I know back, back when I was doing full-time contract engineering, I know that we, I, and and my business partners, uh, we did work for some stations. Uh, one in particular was a was a black gospel station in Jackson, Tennessee, and I know that the way we got paid was the the minister who owned the station 
took up a collection at his church. It, it wasn't there. He would live somewhere else. I don't know. I don't remember where. It may have been New York City. But he took up a collection at his church. And I'm pretty sure that they passed. He said, he said in the congregation, folks, we had to replace the tubes in the transmitter this past week, and it was very expensive. And we're going to pass the plate and see if we can get these things paid for so we can keep the gospel music flowing to the folks in West Tennessee. Pass the plate. I'm pretty sure that the plate came <laughs> back. The pastor said, I need to make myself clear. These engineers are very expensive. <laughs> Well, we, you know, we, and, and I tell you, we, we ended up doing a, I mean, back when I was doing this full time, did a lot of free work for, uh, for folks in Mississippi yeah. well, and West Tennessee. Some of them just didn't have you know, good business models. And you know, I, my heart went out to them. I, 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 felt I think sorry. the other, I, I think the other problem is too, is, is, and, and to be perfectly straight, and I'm sure there'll be some guys out there that'll shake their head. Yes. And some that'll go, ah, oh, you're full of crud. I, I do think that there are a lot of contract engineers out there that do charge way too much money for just bad work or or very little work. But that's and, true. And that's they, true. Yeah, I mean, they look at it as I can charge you this money because you're going to pay it, and you know, I clean up a lot of those messes. And you know, I've always had this this. I always have the same agreement with all of my clients. First of all, if I come out and I fix something, and a day later it's not right, I come back for free, and I you know until it's right. You know, and and uh, you know the other thing is is if I go if, if I go to do something, it's, if it's not out of my way. Now, if I have to drive an hour to do it, they're going to get a bill. But you know, if it's one of those deals where I'm around and it's a ten minute, you know, turn a screw, I'm not going to send a bill. You know, I'm just not. And but I think that um, you know, lot, some of these operators are just afraid because they've been burned before by uh, you know by being overcharged. Yeah, that's you're absolutely right with that. I've actually, hey, uh, 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 Chris, uh, Chris Tar, we're going to reconnect with you here in just a minute and see if we can get your, your feet a bit better. Chris Tobin, now in your area, in New York City, you know, the imagination that I have is that every New York station has a slew of engineers, you know, one to take care of each turntable, right? And, and uh, I guess I, over the last 20 years, I, I, in many major markets, we've seen the number of engineers at big city stations dwindle. Uh, they've been cut back through attrition or 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 whatever uh, through mergers and 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 so what's the what do you find is a situation in New York? Are there stations in New York that only call the engineer when they're off the air or close to it? Yes, um, really, and not New York City itself, New York City proper. Uh, mm -hmm. Most of those stations still have somebody on staff. Uh, you know, they may have one or two less than they should for the number of stations they're operating, but they have someone on staff. But the outer uh, regions, if you will, like the suburbs. There are some stations, say Long Island, parts of New Jersey and uh, Connecticut or Westchester, where there are stations that uh, basically they'll pay somebody when they're close to being off the air or they have enough failures at the station where it's it's obvious they got to get somebody in soon. Um, mm. I, I, I it's I've worked for several stations <laughs> over 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 the years that operate in that fashion. I've been called in to help f fix problems after. Contract and en contract engineers have come in and apparently didn't do it right, as Chris pointed out. Uh, but I think the saddest part is that we, as an engineering community, at times have sort of shot ourselves in the foot too. Because um, I could say that I know I've practiced working with, I'll call it the management of the radio station, the non-engineering or the non-technical people, and explain mm -hmm. to them in layman's terms how things function, why you need to do stuff, and when it comes time to fixing problems, I've actually put together an ROI plan or you know business plan. And say, look. You know the transmitter is functioning at one hundred percent. However, the readings are showing that, the st in the case of a tube transmitter, tube's yeah. going soft. I've done enough. I've done as much as I can to keep it alive. But the way it looks, you may have six months. Here's what's going to happen: if it goes out, you'll be off the air. <clears throat> your hourly, your commercial rate is X. Your audience is Y. Based on the current market values, all these things, you could be losing upwards of some, you know, X number of dollars per hour. It's up to you. Here's the cost of replacing the tube. You know, three thousand dollars to save fifteen thousand dollars in ad revenue. Your choice. Nine times out of ten, after I've sat with the manager or sent the email or letter and said, "Here's what you got. Your call." You know, I'll be more than happy to help you out. Nine times out of ten, they will send me a, a, a note and say, "Place the order and schedule a time to fix the problem." Yeah. Because yeah. I put it in their terms, but you don't always have that luck because you you will have some I'll call them pig-headed uh, business people that they just shouldn't be running a business and they just don't see it that way and they. They find some other excuse to say, oh, you're wrong. That's not how it works. I talked to a friend of mine who does technology, and he says, that's not true. I'm like, really? Okay. Has your friend worked on a 4CX 10,000D, a 15,000-watt transmitter? 
Because if he has, I'd be more happy to talk to him about what he overlooked. You know, you never get to talk to the friend, but that, yeah. <laughs> that, that's the other side of the coin. But I, I can tell you, <clears throat> in parts of this area and up north, I've done some work in Rhode Island, and there have been a few very tight-budgeted radio stations. But I have to say, they, they, when, you, when you sort of paint the picture properly and don't come across as condescending, um, they, they, they make it happen. But I'm sure there's places that, no matter what you do, they're just not going to do it. Yeah, for for a station owner, I got to think it's it, it can be tough. It's tough. Um, if you're well, it, yeah, because you you may not be technical yourself, and hey, as far as your choice of engineers, there may be one <laughs> in in your area. I mean, there's big parts of Arkansas, big parts of West uh, Arkansas that you know there may be one guy who's honestly a, a a contract engineer, and I'm and I'm really not not picking on anybody in Arkansas. I, I don't know this for myself. I do know that when I lived in Memphis, there was a huge shortage of anybody in in Arkansas. Um, and, but I've been to stations where, uh, let's say, I was out of town, unavailable, and I, but I was the regular guy. The owner called me back when I got back into town, and he said, Kirk, we've been off the air here for three days, and -and so-and-so says uh, that we need a whole new power supply for this transmitter. The power supply consisted of all the normal big high-voltage parts that it does. I said, everything? He says, yep, got it. So we've got to replace everything. It'll be about uh, $4,000, and uh, he'll get the parts on order from Harris as as soon as I say yes. So, well, why don't we troubleshoot what the exact problem is? And I said, let's see what the symptoms are. And, you know, I did the divide and conquer thing, and it, it was a choke shorted to its frame. As it so often is. Oh yeah, in yeah. A, a high voltage uh, power supply, and all we did was we you know, we found a piece of you know five kilovolt wood, and and stuck it and you know unbolted the choke and put it on top of the five kilovolt rated piece of wood and went back on the air uh, and ordered a, a new choke. Now of course you you do find the stations where a new choke was never ordered, right? Yes. And it's been sitting on the five kilovolt piece of wood for years. But you know we we ordered one, did, did it right, and the total cost, including my labor. It was under a thousand dollars because you know the choke wasn't cheap. I wanted three, four, five hundred dollars, something like that, and I made two trips. So um, yeah, obviously. So yeah, there's there are people in our business who give our business or, or our profession, what we do, a, a bad name. Um, and yeah, what what do you do about that? T- typically, well, you know, I don't know. I would think that typically, if you can find an engineer who is um, uh, an SBE member. Because he's probably going to be rubbing elbows and shoulders with other good engineers. Um, uh, it's, it's not a guarantee, but it's a good sign. Uh, if he has satisfaction with other station owners uh, who feel like they're treated well and given the honest take on whatever's wrong, great. But it's, so it's, it's like everything else. You, buyer beware and, and uh, um, uh, you know, care enough about it to, to, to check the guy out. This girl. is true. I mean, I, I got called into a station once. It turned out that the I had I was friends with the program director of the radio station, and we had crossed paths on a couple of other things outside the station. I was working as a contract engineer for the station, and we just happened to hit it off. I understood what he did in programming. I, I joked with him from time to time on some of the songs in rotation. I said, you know what, your hourly cum is going to go down, and the you know this is going to be it's going to be a nightmare when when the book comes out. This is back when the Arbitron books were still around. And he would laugh. He's like, what do you know about this? I said, i tell you what. And we'd joke around, and I'd come up with some goofy numbers and just make up stuff. And sometimes it would actually come true, and he'd be like, I don't know how you knew that. I'd say, eh, it's just beginner's luck. But then one day he called, and he said, hey, I'm having a problem with our transmitter site, I think. I said, why do you say that? Well, every so often when, it, when the, the weather gets bad, we go off the air and we come back. I was like, okay, that's, that could be many things. I said, don't you guys have an engineer that you can call on? Well, no. The guy we have is our IT administrator. And the... Mm. Owner, the, the general manager of the station believes that uh, he, he, he knows what he's doing because he dresses well. I kid you not. This is what he said. He dresses well and, and knows how to speak the language of a general manager. And I just sat there going, really? And what language would that be? I said, I don't recall that in the pull-down menu on choice of language for software. <laughs> I said, okay. So he goes, would you mind coming with me out to the transmitter site? I said, I have no objection. However, I think it's best you tell your general manager what you're looking to do. And come up with a reason why you want me to come out there. So he did. I'm not sure what he told him. I don't want to know. We get out there. Very nice facility. You know, average uh, place. A 3,000 watt FM station. uh, 10,000 watt AM directional. And there's a a broomstick handle. A wooden broomstick handle. Propped up against the front of the transmitter. It's a tube transmitter. And I'm looking from the distance. From the doorway. As as the door opens. I, I let him go in first. And... Then I look around quickly, uh, you know, do a situation report. Let's see what the sit rep is of the room before I walk in. And I'm noticing a few things. And then I saw that. I was like, wow, what is a broom handle doing propped up? I'm thinking, oh, it must be just the broom. I look at the floor side. 
there's no bristles on the end of that broom handle. It is literally no. just a, a handle. No. Yeah. And I'm looking, and I look closer, and believe it or not, that broom handle is used to keep the plate circuit breaker, the high voltage plate circuit breaker, on. <laughs> <laughs> apparently I, <laughs> I my buddy looks at me he's like that doesn't look normal I said I can assure you it's not but I'm sure there's a good story behind this <laughs> yeah can we, not a good reason but a good story can we can we get a hold of the guy who comes out here and take checks on your station on the, on when you go off the air he goes oh yeah that's the IT guy I said good let's get him on the phone so I talked to him I said hey great work you got this place going keeping things along good to see that you know you're able to go beyond your, your skills of IT he goes D he goes like this dude I have no idea what the hell I'm doing out there, but I don't want to lose my job. I'm like, oh, okay, I understand fully. Uh, can you have a minute to come out to the transmitter site? Sure. Comes out about 10 minutes later. Take him aside. I said, explain to me your thinking behind the broom handle and the circuit breaker. He goes, oh, it's, it's um, yeah, it, the circuit breaker trips whenever we have bad weather for some reason. I, I wasn't sure why, but I found out by putting the, the stick up against it, it keeps it from tripping. I say, yes, that's the mechanical portion of that project does does hold true. He goes, but once in a while, then something else goes wrong. I say, really? I can't imagine what it could be. <laughs> so, <laughs> so uh, long story short, I, I uh, the program director convinces the general manager to have me come in and, and do some work. Turns out that the uh, transmitter was operating at maximum voltage, so the the plate current. Plate voltages were at the upper end of the spectrum where they sh shouldn't be. And uh, so when the bad weather would come, power companies were having, you know, the power company would have issues with trees hitting power lines. You know how it goes, surges. So the voltage would, would swing to the high side just enough to trip the breaker. So they decided yeah. to stop making a trip. We got that fixed. But the general manager's impression of engineering was this well-dressed, smartly speaking individual, not... Have you worked in radio before? Have you worked at radio station transmitter facilities before? Have you installed a transmitter? Or are you familiar with the principles of RF? No. It was he dressed well, spoke the language, and you know he just felt good about him. I kid you not. And then three months later, same person still doing this stuff. I get a call once in a while to come out because he was on vacation. I get a phone call from a gentleman who I happen to know, so it's a good thing I had a relationship with this gentleman. He uh, calls up and says, hey, I'm having a problem. I'm coming out to a radio station in your area. I believe you have some uh, working relationship with them. Uh, would you be av available to come out and meet me? I was like, well, I'm, a, I'm, not a, I'm on contract with them, but their designated chief operator is not me. It's this other guy. He's like, no, I'm quite aware of that. I've already made a visit to the studios. I was like, oh, how about that? I said, would you be going out the transmitter today? He goes, yes. Would you be willing to join me? I said, absolutely. This gentleman who I'm talking about is a representative from the Federal Communications Commission field office. Apparently, the radio station was operating in violation of what they would consider outside the parameters of their license. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> On their AM station. Oh. So those of you in the, in the audience that are familiar with AM modulation, uh, amplitude modulation, and, and clipping the carrier, or over-modulating negatively, uh, this station, 10,000 watts, directional, was clipping the carrier very well at about uh, 8,000 watts. So you can imagine the, <laughs> the spectral noise going across the AM band in the vicinity of this, this transmitter's frequency. And yeah, again, they weren't being good neighbors. They had lots of noisy dogs. Oh, oh so yeah. Oh, those dogs were barking. And uh, again, General Manager's like, what do you mean? We, we, everything is fine. Our guy knows what he's doing. And the FCC manager just looked at him and says, well, for a person who knows what he's doing, here's a notice of uh, apparent liability for $10,000. Thank you very much. I just stood there going... Wow, so that's what it looks like when they issue a fine. <laughs> <laughs> Sadly, the uh, the IT administrator lost his job, you know, several days later as a result of this. But the general manager didn't bat an eyelash; just continued on doing their thing. And um, well, was the IT guy doing a good job with IT? As far as I can tell, yeah, yeah. Well, but they that's, but, they, I mean, but yeah. It's, it's this perception thing; they just didn't see it that way, or oh. it didn't, you know, it didn't correlate, or. I, I, I kid you not, when I sat in this guy's office and he explained to me why he thought this guy was, you know, was the manna from heaven. I was like, yeah. I, I get it. I'm not going to say anything because, you know, he's doing well and God bless him for being able to cover his base as best he could. But I don't know. I don't know how you get around that. I don't know how, how to change it. 
Uh, Chris Tar, you you may have seen seen this yourself. You know, mix this mixing of of IT skills and and RF skills. And sure, we're mo- we've we, not we're moving. We've moved into a, a very IT centric world. I mean, just look at this show and 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 how people are are watching this show and and all that. Um, but th- just down the road from me, there is a the production facility of a big national talk show, one of the big ones. And we were installing some gear there, and it became clear that we needed help from the IT guys. And we, me and the and the the, the uh, at that time the uh, the engineer there, the, the audio engineer I was working with just didn't know that much about IT. And the IT guys, uh, we let them hook up the like the the skimming the the logging PC, and it was quite obvious they didn't know anything about audio. Um, we now luckily there was not a wall or any animosity between the two. We just had to work together. And it all came out great. We had the best of IT and the best of, of audio, and they, they came together just great. Um, Chris Tarr, do you, do you find that wall or, or difficulty at, at stations? Uh, and is the value of the engineer uh, deprecated because of the perceived need now for IT? I, I think it's unnecessarily deprecated, but it's more from the view of the general manager. Uh a good example of this is a station I'm working with, a group of stations I'm working with right now uh, that are looking for, you know, possibly bringing me on to do some contract work. I did some quick emergency stuff for them. They have an IT guy. They don't, they're, they're contract engineer. They're not doing much with anymore. I think he's looking to get out of the market or something. And, you know, we we're kind of discussing how things would work. And, and I was all for, you know, I, I, you know, let me back up, I, you know, the reality of our job nowadays is that a good 80% of what we deal with is, is IT. You know, the transmitters generally run okay. The studio equipment is, you know, is what it is. Once it's set up, it generally plays well. So most of the time you're dealing with automation systems and you're dealing with, you know, those sorts of IT related things. And, you know, that again, that's where a good engineer can bring value to the table. I sat down with the general manager and said, listen, I can probably, you know, help your IT guy understand at least the basic concepts of, of RF and transmitters and all the equipment enough to where, you know, you're not having to rely on me to come in all the time to be fixing stuff. You know, this guy can probably handle the basics, putting a thing here or there and, and that kind of thing. And you know, I come and help on the big projects, transmitters break or, you know, Marty units are, are not working or something like that, or, you know, consoles blow up. But I think just because there are so few you know, you were talking earlier about having a hard time finding a contract engineer. This group of stations uh, I stumbled upon, I got a phone call at five o'clock in the morning from one of the guys saying, I, I, you don't know me, but I'm sorry, I'm calling you at 5 a.m. We're off the air. and We don't have anybody else to call. We're trying everyone in our Rolodex. Nobody's available anymore. You're it. Can you come help us? And, you know, that's kind of how this started. And yeah. Uh, you know that, and that's happening more and more. And, and I've said a couple of times, you know, we've discussed this when I was with SBE on the national board, that I think we're coming into an era where you're going to find mostly IT guys as the day-to-day front line at the radio stations, and you're going to get guys like Chris Tobin and myself and Tom Ray's of the world who kind of work as almost de facto regional engineers, you know, just for everybody. And you float around and, and take care of the you know AM arrays and the transmitters and the, the the maintenance and some of the FCC related stuff. Uh, and I, I think we're going to see more and more of that because these IT guys, it's not that they're incompetent; they're very good IT guys. Uh, it's just that they didn't you know who do you know new in this business who's you know who had any kind of exposure to working with transmitters? Just very few. And, and those who are kind of started as IT guys were at least interested in that field and, and moved over. So, um, you know, I think we're going to find more and more of that. You know, I, I try to find it in all the stations that I do work with. I try to identify a key person that I know is going to be kind of my, my engineering buddy who I know that, you know, when things, uh, you know, are, are having an issue, that's the front line. That's the triage person. I know that that person at least understands what I'm saying, you know, has a basic grasp of the equipment and can repair these things or at least, give me a good idea of what's going on and I can work with them to hopefully get things fixed. So, uh, anyway, so I, long, long story short, I stretch that way out to answer your question. I, I do think that it guys are kind of prematurely getting elevated because, Hey, they're technical guys. It's technical stuff. Okay, great. No problem. <laughs> uh, but I, I also think, I also think that, 
you know, as engineers, as contract engineers especially, we should, we, you know, we shouldn't have that animosity. We should work with them. And you'll find in, in most cases, these people really want to learn. They're excited to be working with somebody who knows who isn't treating them like that. You know, this, this IT guy in particular said, you know, the last engineer hated me because he thought I was trying to do his job. And, you know, oh, he'd get yeah. mad when I, I mess with stuff. Whereas I'm actually learning stuff from you and I appreciate that. So uh, I, I think there is that animosity, but I think that kind of goes both ways. And I think that's, that's a, it's a shame because I think that is kind of where things are going to have to go. Yeah, yeah. That's true. Hey, uh, we're talking about the value of engineers on This Week in Radio Tech. You know, uh, after, we, uh, after we hear from our sponsor, Omnia, let's move into some of the discussion about how, how uh, you might – figure on on charging a station is it just by the hour can you charge by the job hey one time i had a harebrained idea you pay me this much a month and for every minute you're off the air i'll deduct x amount from your bill and if you're off the air more than two days out of the month you'll owe me nothing <laughs> i mean it's you know that's i this cra- never worked out but we might want to th- talk about uh, ideas for incentivizing stations to keep you on retainer to keep maintenance done so it doesn't seem like this big hourly charge every time you walk in the door. We'll think about that in a minute. You're watching This Week in Radio Tech, episode number 191. I'm Kirk Harnack, along with Chris Tobin and Chris Tarr, two of our regulars. By the way, coming up on future episodes of This Week in Radio Tech, we've got Greg Oganowski is going to make another appearance on the show. Also, Scott Feibush of Northeast Radio Watch and the Feibush Famous calendar is he's going to be here with us uh kevin trueblood is finding time to be with us and and more so check it out stay with us we got lots of great episodes up ahead our show this week is brought to you by omnia audio and a really cool product this has been around for a while but it's it's just so good and more and more broadcasters internet webcasters are using it it's the omnia one multicast version folks this is the creme de la creme of audio streaming internet uh, processing or streaming internet audio processing or audio processing for internet. Anyway, this will uh, really prepare your audio for the bit rate uh, reduced encoder that's going to follow it. Whether it's MP3 or AAC or even MPEG Layer 2 or, heaven forbid, you're still using real audio or Windows Media, whatever your format is that you're streaming with, the Omnia One We'll prep that audio for it. Now, the Omnia One Multicast, this is special software. It's not for AM. It's not for FM. It's not for shortwave transmission. It is specially designed to process the audio and properly do limiting on the audio and bandwidth control so that a bitrate reduced audio encoder can have the best time encoding it, get the most efficiency out of that encoder. And hey, if you're knocking this thing, your audio down to you know 48 kilobits per second, or or maybe less, maybe a bit more, you need for that audio for that encoder to be efficient. Well, the Omnia One is the second generation of uh, audio processor for coded audio. It includes Frank Foti's invention, this special thing called Census, S E N S U S, Census audio conditioning technology. It's kind of like conditioner for your audio. Seriously, it it examines the audio and figures out what about this instance of audio is going to be difficult for the encoder that's following me to encode properly. And so the census technology actually adjusts the audio spectral qualities of the audio and whether it should do more compression or less compression. There's a good feedback loop there that conditions the audio for the the, uh, the encoding to follow. And I got to tell you, at really low bit rates, it makes a huge difference. At high bit rates, you don't really need this census technology as much, but at low bit rates, oh my gosh, I've heard recordings of a male voice uh, being encoded at a pretty low bit rate, like 24 kilobits per second. And the uh, the wateriness and the, uh, uh, the other artifacts that go along with low bit rate audio encoding, they disappear. The intelligibility just goes way up. And uh, believe me, we're not just boosting the highs or boosting the lows. We're dynamically controlling several aspects of the audio. It's all quite variable, and that's what the census technology does. Um, if your business, if you're depending on streaming audio for listeners, for long-term listeners, the Omnia One Multicast is really, really the way to go. 
Uh, the uh, Omni One, by the way, you can load different software into it. So if you buy a, a multicast and find later on that you get an FM transmitter, you need an FM processor, you can load the FM uh, software in it, and the the ports on the back that for that just come alive. Um, uh, it's it, it's a great deal also to keep an extra one. Let's say you're a corporate broadcaster and you've got a number of transmitter sites, AM, FM, and you've got some streams. You know, you can keep just one spare audio processor that will, in a minute or two, substitute for any of those. You can have two different softwares loaded into it, switch them immediately just by rebooting, and you can load other software into it as well. So the Omnia One Multicast, please check it out. It's got four bands of AGC, uh, four bands of limiting, the census technology, and a very low distortion look-ahead final limiter that actually predicts distortion and eliminates it before it happens. It's on the web at omniaaudio.com slash one. And then you can do slash multi if you want to, but check it out. I like it. It's being used on this very webcast on the audio, uh, the audio only uh, version of it. All right. Our show is This Week in Radio Tech, episode 191, brought to you by Omnia Audio. We're talking about the value of an engineer. Chris Tarr, how do you keep an, a, a manager, or is, is there a way to keep a manager or station owner from seeing you come in the door and just look at this black hole full of $75 an hour or whatever it may be? <laughs> yeah, I, I think so, and I, I do a pretty good job of that. Um, you know, most, first of all, it's, I, you know, it's all about communication. It is absolutely the key to make this work. Anytime I do any work at all, I document it and I give a full report to the general manager, whoever's in charge after I'm done. Everything, good, bad, and ugly. And I think a lot of times, you know, it because I, all of a sudden I am no longer that black hole. I'm actually a partner in the business and I have his uh, or hers uh, uh, radio station in mind and their business in mind. Uh, so, uh, you know, uh, an example of that is, you know, let's say they do need to buy a piece of equipment. Maybe, you know, I can advance, so listen, you're going to need this piece of equipment um, you know, I can work around it for now, but if you want to let me know, you know, what month you want to spend the money on this, let me know and we'll, we'll make this work. So, uh, you know, it's all about communication. And I think a lot of times if you can, if you can communicate clearly and show your results, they're more than happy to pay the money. Uh, but, but that's the thing. If you just kind of in the middle of the night, show up, do some things, don't say anything, send them a bill, uh, you know, or show up just when they're having a bad day then you are going to be that guy. But you know, a lot of times, you know, I'll just come in for free and just say, hi, how's it going? Anything you need me to look at while I'm here? I just wanted to make sure everything was okay. And follow up, you know, a couple weeks later, hey, everything all right? Anything I can do for you? Um, you know, in one situation, I offered to take uh, ES logging off their hands. Hey, can I help you with that? You know, no problem. Uh, so, you know, again, it's, it, as, as Chris Tobin said a little while ago, and, and I think you alluded to too, there, there are some contract guys out there who are more than happy to collect the money don't really care about the results you know we clean up a lot of that mess. Uh, but also we don't we don't want to be that guy. we want to be a business partner and yeah. and yeah. you know i am their employee i work for the radio station i work in their best interest and everything i do is in their best interest well you can dress the part too to make the money <laughs> right right or if you know computers and can look good and talk like a gm you're in yeah i'm telling you i <laughs> i can assure you i have uh <clears throat> I've done many a contract with stations and made sure when I came in I uh, was wearing a jacket and tie, maybe not a suit depending on where the station was, and sat down and explained to them why the hourly rate was what it is and explained to them the value added uh, that you get. And, uh, you know, it took a little doing, but they realized and said, okay, we understand, we'll go with that. And then there were places where, um, unfortunately, they just they just had in their head that there was no need to pay the money that was being asked. And I think that was partly because of previous uh, contractors they probably got burned by, but they wouldn't say anything. Um, but I'll if you do it right, I've, you know, like you pointed out, Chris, if you do it right and talk to them, and y you should be able to get the you know market value. I'll, I'll tell you, I have never, surprisingly enough, because I always worry about that. I have never been turned down after I've presented my rates ever. Yeah. And and you know they're not cheap, they're not really expensive, but you know they're. They're more than a lot of guys charge, but I, I'll, I'll tell you what. I mean, you know, sometimes you're a little hesitant at first until I get to work, but I, I've never been dropped. Every person that I've done contract work for, I still, you know, if I choose to do work for them, there have been a few that I've fired, but uh, I've never been not asked back uh, ever. 
and I have small and long stations, and you know, so far, every one of them have said they've gotten exceptional value for the money they've spent. And again, it's always because I treat them, I, I treat myself as a business, but I try to be fair to them. And again, fair sometimes means making a little mess, less money than I could. I, I could build them up to the exact minute and get an extra out of hour out of them, but you know, I don't. I usually err on the side of of underbilling a little bit. And and again, they all know that, and they all know that it's fair. And I'm happy. I'm making enough money to get by. And, you know, they're getting the work done. So I think, again, as I said at the beginning of the show, it's not necessarily about money. I mean, there is that. I got to make a living and I got to pay the bills. But it's also about value. And, and you know, I, I want to look, I want them to look at me as money well spent. And so far, that's been the case. And I think that if we all as engineers treat it that way and look at it as something more than just hammer to make a quick buck here. Uh, you know, look at it as, hey, I'm a partner in this radio station, and you know, I want them when I walk away. I want them to look at them, and go, you know, look at the the their checkbook and go, this is this is money that we're happy to spend. That you know was totally worth every cent. And if you can walk away from that, if they feel that way, and you feel like you've done a good job for them, at the end of the day, I think that that's fantastic. Yeah, you're right. You're right. That's exactly how it'll go. You got to build a relationship, and you know, you no- know. Don't be the engineer that comes in only at night on the weekends and nobody knows where you are or ever sees you. Well, that's how you get oh, started, and, though. And, <laughs> From and your somebody, day job. In the, somebody in the chat room brought this up too. Uh, you know, co- you know, an actual signing a contract versus uh, a, a, a contract type of guy. Um, I think a lot of that is what you're comfortable with. Now, for me, you know, in, in all the situations that I'm in so far, except for well, one or two. Um, I'm actually an employee of the radio station. I've convinced them to take me on part time. And part of the reason is it saves on liability insurance, number one. Uh, number two, they take all the taxes out, so I don't have to deal with it. Uh, and number three, I, I like to position it as if I'm on their payroll, they, you know, they, they don't look at me as much as a contract guy as an employee. And, and we have a little better relationship, I find. And then there are others who just prefer to pay me, just write a check, and we're done. And you know, in that case... Uh, you know, there are some accounting and some things that you want to take care of and you want to make sure to set expectations up correctly, you know, what they're going to get and for what and, and you know, how much it's going to cost and, and what the parameters are. Uh, but to answer, I don't really have a generic contract because I, I, one size doesn't really fit all. So generally, if it's a, if it is a contract agreement, I'll do one, you know, I have kind of a boilerplate thing, but then I change it around to kind of fit the, the person that, or the group that I'm working with. So, gosh, what uh, I was about to make a comment now. It's just flown straight out of my head of, about um, uh, about. The, oh yeah, well, of course, being well dressed that that helps. Uh, I knew a guy in uh, in Memphis actually for years. Uh, he's and he's he's now a, you know, a well known uh, uh, engineer in, in in the Clear Channel system. But he would he would uh, come dressed in a in at least a suit jacket and slacks and, and a dress shirt. But when he went he went to the transmitter side or did work in the studios. He just put coveralls on zip him up uh well he take the jacket off of course but so he didn't get his uh his nice clothes dirty uh and and he could you know get the coveralls uh, all all dirty i was just looking um at uh, i was thinking about what i was charging for contract engineering back in the day back in 1987 i think i was charging about 35 dollars an hour and um that's when i first moved to memphis and was was building what became rock 98 there and in Twenty-twelve dollars. That's about seventy dollars an hour. Seems a little low to me, but thirty-five dollars an hour is probably a little bit low. Uh, then t- that's t- just what, inflation. Set, just. I mean, seventy dollars is what I'm getting. Yeah, yeah. So that's um, right. now is is that portal to portal, or is that when clock starts when you get on site? Uh, well, generally, depending on again, that's one of those things that depends on the agreement. Most of the time, I do a flat one hour for travel, in addition yeah. to that. Um, and then I'll bill in, you know, 10 or 15 minute increments. If it's something like phone call, you know, tech support over the phone or, you know, something in that, that situation right off the house. Um, plus there's, you know, I charge extra. There's an extra 10 or $15 an hour if it's the middle of the night in an emergency or, you know, something like that. But, um, you know, again, it all, you know, each, each one is a little bit different. That's my, you know, as I like to say, that's the rate card rate. Uh, but, you know, I have. Like I said, I have, I have one station that's just a retainer, and then it's anything over a certain amount of hours. I have another one where they actually took me on as a part-time employee, and I get paid 
you know, uh, an hourly rate, which is actually still that, you know, $60, $70 an hour. Uh, but as a part-time employee, uh, I have, you know, all kinds of different situations. But I, I think it's a one-size, it's, you know, one-size-fits-all doesn't always work. I think a lot of it has to depend on the kind of job it is. You know, I, I'll tell you what, the, the people who pay the most are the ones who pay me to be a fireman. Ah, uh, yeah, yeah. I hear you. And that cause, not because you want to put the screws to them, but because it's, there's more work to be done. Right. Well, and it's inconvenient for me. You know, if I, if I have to fix it, uh, if I can mm -hmm. fix it on my time, it's a lot more convenient than if I have to fix it on their time. So tell me what you think about this notion. Uh, back when I was full-time contract engineering, I, uh, I would make a commitment to my customer. I would say, look, I got to tell you, I don't know everything about everything. Um, uh, yeah, I know I may act like I do, but I, I really don't. And whenever I come across a piece of equipment that's new to me, I don't know its ins and outs. I don't know its quirkiness. Maybe I come across a, uh, a circuit. Maybe you've got a really interesting antenna tuning unit at your tower site that I don't understand. Maybe there's this, you know, one that, that PSSA low power thing where we're throwing a hundred Watts or 500 Watts of power into a dummy load and eking out six watts to the tower. If I don't understand something, I'm not going to charge you by the hour for me to understand it. Yeah, I, and I'm not going to charge you by the hour for a coffee break uh, or, or talking to your sales manager. I'm going to charge you my rate, which is a, a strong rate. I'm going to charge you by the hour for things that I know how to do, know how to fix, and I'm in the process of fixing them and making them right and improving them so that they're not going to go wrong again anytime soon. I'm not going to charge you for my education or for you know, drinking coffee. Uh, with the uh, uh, you know with the disc jockey, it was is that an attitude that that it seemed to work well for me and uh, yeah oh absolutely I mean I you know I I always say that you know I always tell them that, that you know that, and that's why if I don't fix it right I'll come back on my dime and make sure that it is um, I had a situation where there was something that needed to be fixed and I just couldn't do it was outside of my uh, my skill set so I had to bring in a, a friend of mine who had the skill set I paid him to to do that. It did, you know, they, they didn't get double billed for that time. Um, so that came out of my pocket. In fact, I lost money because he charged more than what I charged. Uh, <laughs> but they needed that. They needed somebody with that skill set. So, yeah, I don't charge for breaks or, or, you know, for if I'm messing around or tinkering around. Uh, you know, again, I always just, like I said, I always err on the side of them in terms of billing, and it's never been a problem. Um. So, Chris Tobin, uh, we're going to run out of time here in a minute or two. Tell us a couple parting thoughts about the value of engineering and, and what that means, in, in, uh, you know, at least in, in your market and your experience. Well, uh, in our market here, in I'll say the New York, New Jersey, Connecticut market, the value of engineering is understanding how the technology is used, uh, being uh, the ability to communicate clearly to those that, you, that are hiring you, whether it be an employee, full-time, part-time, or a contract engineer. Um, and understanding that, as Chris pointed out, like with his contracts, there's no one one size fits all. Understanding that in this business these days, technology has shifted in such a way that, yes, you have IT people working in, in areas that you never would have seen before. And maybe, you know, broadcast engineering people in IT areas. If you can grasp the concept of it's a do-it-yourself society, do-it-yourself uh, way of life these days, you mm -hmm. could probably get by a lot of the stigma that engineering types have, you know, from the pocket protected plaid shirt to the uh, torn jeans, and actually have a, uh, you know, make a good living. As Chris pointed out, you know, he he um he finds ways to work with each of the customers, understand their needs, what they see or perceive and understand about, say, we'll just say the technical person, and then uh, it, it works out. He builds a relationship, and now he enjoys a nice, comfortable, you know, monthly uh, stipend from from everybody, and everything works. I know a lot of folks who cannot. I use the phrase sometimes with folks, you know, these, these are people who should not be allowed to talk to the adults. Some of them just <laughs> don't get it. And they just, you know, just will never will. I don't, I don't know why, but that's just the way it is. I've, I know several friends of mine who are geniuses in engineering. You can give them this, uh, this little device here. I'm holding up an iPhone. And within mm -hmm. 24 hours, they can give you a schematic and a working diagram of how it was designed. But put them in a room with, for, with a social setting and, well, you know, you're taking them out back and say, look, Next time you say something like that to a woman, expect to get slapped twice as hard. <laughs> yeah. You all know what I'm talking about, okay? Yeah. <laughs> so yeah, that's that's the that's the you know from one one spe end of the spectrum to the next. But I value you know engineering value <clears throat> and just understanding and and being able to uh, communicate on all levels with whomever it is you're, you're going to do business with. 
it seems to me it it, it you know the the, the the skill sets of engineers can be all over the map. Yes, there are a few bad apples out there, and there's some awesome great ones too. But then the the spectrum of owners and managers is all over the map too. Fortunately, most of the time, the um, not-as-good engineers find and stick with the not-as-good station owners. They seem made for each other. And the better engineers tend to gravitate to station managers and station owners who are looking to improve and, and looking to... To, to make their situation better. I think uh, Chris Tarr is a perfect example of uh, how he gravitated and the folks at his station uh, that he works with uh, on his day job gravitated toward each other. And, you know, it seems like a very good relationship there where he's helping them to grow in stature in the community and provide better and better uh, uh, programming and content to their listeners. And, and so the whole thing's working out well. And it's good for Chris. It was new challenges for, for Chris a, as well. We Certainly there are uh, engineers in our field who also have the same attitude that Chris Tarr does, that you, Chris Tobin, do, and that I you know, did when I was doing this full-time. We want to genuinely help our customers. And occasionally we get that mismatch, you know, where we, uh, hey, I got a call one time from a station in uh, far east Kentucky, and they said, uh, hey, Kirk, we're, uh, we're off the air. I wonder if you can come down and see us. I said, well, it's going to be a couple days. Before, you know, it's a, a six-hour drive through the mountains to come see you, but yeah, I'll, I tell you, I can be there Saturday. So I got there Saturday, and they said, now, how long have you been off the air? Oh, about a week. I said, well, wait. You waited four or five days to call me when you went off the air? Yeah, yeah, we did. We were just kind of hoping it would come back on, but it never did. Well, so, you know, I kind of don't – and obviously that station wasn't that important to them compared to their other ones that they had. You know, they're, they're, they're really – you know, it kind of boils down to this. Number one is, you know, look at it as, uh, you know, it, it's more than just a job. It's it's helping another radio station and be sure, be, you know, like anything else – under promise of deliver. Second of all, there are a lot of guys out there in this job. I wouldn't say a lot, but there are some guys in this job who like the paycheck but don't like the work. And and there are guys like me who fix the problems that guys like those guys create. So, you know, it's all about attitude. It's all about like, you know, enjoying what you do. And, you know, as I like to say, I, I love nothing more. You know, the, the money's great, but I really enjoy just making great radio wherever I go. And, yeah. and I think, no. I think that really, you know, the general managers that I work with see that in me, they see my enthusiasm. They see the whole, I really get a kick out of making their radio stations work. And I think that's infectious. And I think that <laughs> that's why those relationships work because they can tell that, you know, I mean, I like taking the money, but I have a whole heck of a lot of fun solving their problems. And <laughs> that, you know, as long as that's still the yeah. case. I'm, I'm sorry. I didn't mean to cut you off that. I'm just agreeing with you. That is such a charge. Uh, and, and those of us who've been in radio, you know, we have that love for the medium uh, in us. And, and, you know, hey, we take a situation. And, you know, one of the things I always loved about doing contract engineering is it was almost always instant gratification or at least quick gratification. It wasn't working when we, when we got there or it sounded terrible uh, or it was illegal or something like that. And when we left, it was on the air sounding good the disc jockey's having fun he's loving the processing the program director's happy the general manager phew, i can play some spots again you know let's reschedule all the spots that we missed and you know you made the whole thing better and, i had a uh, i had a station yeah. owner i had a station owner get on the air on my way home from from the station one night he got on the air to thank me because he was so happy about how things were sounding <laughs> <laughs> hey, one time I got to a station and had to play, had to ask the disc jockey to play a certain song and send it out to a certain state trooper who had stopped me about 20 minutes early <laughs> for getting to the station too fast. <laughs> yeah. Hey, uh, we've been, uh, hey, Chris, any, any parting, Chris Tarr, any parting thoughts on the, on this subject? I think we've covered it pretty well. Yeah. I mean, I, I, I think I've, I've said what I need to say just that, you know, again, it's, it's, um, you know, I think there, it's a new day. Uh, and a new era in in the engineering world, and I think that um, you know there's going to be more more opportunities for guys like you. Well, you're not you're not doing that anymore, Kirk. You're in management now, but uh, you know guys like Tobin and me and and Tom Ray and and some of these other guys. Uh, you know, I think that that you know we're still kind of the future of this business, and um, I, I think in a lot of ways it's good. I think for a lot of stations that's a good thing because I think that the people who were in it just to make a buck are getting out of it and the people who really like what they do are staying in it. And I think that's good for everybody. Yeah. All right. Chris Tarr, thank you very much from McWanago, Wisconsin and Chris Tobin from 
Queens, New York, tonight at uh, the headquarters of the GFQ Network. Thanks for joining us as well. Our You're show welcome. has been uh, has been about the value of engineers. We're talking about this, the little microcosm that's big in our world of engineers and, and uh, broadcast facilities. Not everybody's business model can afford a full-time or two full-time or more engineers. They use part-timers or contractors. And uh, there's value in maintaining your gear because, hey, if you're off the air, how much can you charge for a commercial, really? So remember that and uh, treat your engineer well. And you engineers, you treat your customers well, your employers well. Get in the game and learn what you got to learn and do it right. And quit grumbling and just get it done. That's my advice. Our show's been brought to you by Omnia Audio and the Omnia One multicast audio processor. It's the perfect processor. It's the best processor out there for IP audio streaming. Anytime you're doing bit rate reduction like MP3, AAC, MP2, Aptex, whatever it may be, use the Omnia One to make it sound fabulous, as good as it can possibly sound. It's a whole different set of parameters than AM or FM transmission. Thanks to Andrew Zarian back at the GFQ Network for switching our show and producing it. We appreciate his work and all you loyal viewers and listeners on This Week in Radio Tech. We'll be back again next week with another episode of This Week in Radio Tech. Bye-bye, everybody. That's all the bandwidth we can pill for this week. Another tort has propagated, and all the transmitters and audio equipment live happily ever after, thanks to the handsome engineer and his kind, benevolent care. We'll be back next week. Lord willing, and the creek don't rise. This Week in Radio Tech. Subscribe to iTunes, and you'll never miss a show. Search for This Week in Radio Tech in the iTunes Store. Soliciting is strictly encouraged. If you liked today's show, tell a friend. If you didn't like it, we were never here. Kirk Harnack's wardrobe provided by the Salvation Army and the Red Cross Disaster Relief Services. Hair and makeup provided by Penny Lope Garcia Hernandez Weinberg. He's unique, wouldn't you say? I just want to get it over with. This ends this transmission. Tango, Whiskey, India, Romeo, Tango. Signing off. Okay. <laughs>